Combat journalism is nearly as old as war itself. The famous ancient historian Herodotus set a high standard with his detailed accounts of the Greco-Persian Wars, underscoring the importance of recording conflicts that would shape history. However, it often comes at a steep price. Truthful reporting uncovers muddled propaganda, informs society, and conveys urgently needed transparency. But fact-finding can be deadly, especially in political hotspots and battlefields around the world. In the video today, we're trying to shine a light on some of the brave men and women who went to war and never came back. Number 10. Marie Colvin as one of the most prolific war correspondents in recent decades, Marie Colvin routinely risked her life from the front line. The hard-drinking, chain-smoking American journalist was known for both her fearlessness and her abrasive demeanor. She established a well-earned reputation by venturing into danger zones often overlooked and where others feared to go. Her travels took her from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe and all hostile regions in between. While covering the civil war in Sri Lanka in 2001, she lost an eye in a grenade attack and wore a black eye patch that became her defiant trademark. Colvin's relentless courage and swagger became the stuff of legend during an incident in East Timor where she helped save over 1,500 women and children under attack by Indonesian-backed forces. Unmasking the subterfuge that often surrounds war became another defining trait throughout her career, and it would ultimately cost her her life. On assignment for the Sunday Times, she revealed atrocities against civilians in Syria by the Assad-led government, such as the use of chemical weapons. She gave her last broadcast on February 21, 2012 from the besieged city of Homs and was killed the following day by a rocket attack from Syrian artillery. Colvin's devotion to exposing human rights violations continues to be her enduring legacy. Her life has been the subject of several recent books and documentaries, including the 2018 film A Private War. Number 9. Bill Stewart ABC News correspondent Bill Stewart got out of his press van on June 20, 1979, near a roadblock in Managua, Nicaragua. He had been covering the escalating war between the Sandinista rebels and the government troops under President Somoza. An armed National Guardsman ordered Stewart and his interpreter, Juan Espinosa, to lie on the ground. Moments later, the soldier aimed his rifle and shot both men dead at close range. Although only 37 at the time of his death, Stewart was already a veteran newsman, having previously covered the fighting in Lebanon and the revolution in Iran. He had been in Nicaragua for 10 days, reporting from the inner city of the capital, an area with some of the most intense battles between the two sides. Stewart's murder, recorded by fellow ABC reporters and broadcast in the United States, spurred an international outcry that eventually led to the ouster of Somoza's brutal regime. The incident occurred a day after the government-owned media attacked foreign reporters covering the war, accusing them of taking part in an international communist conspiracy. In Washington, President Jimmy Carter responded, stating, The murder of Bill Stewart in Nicaragua was an act of barbarism that all civilized people condemn. Number 8. Tim Hetherington like many on this list, Tim Hetherington's immense body of work saw him cast in multiple roles – photojournalist, filmmaker, artist, author, and human rights activist. The Briton is probably best known for Restrepo, an award-winning documentary which he co-directed with Sebastian Junger about the life inside of America's outpost in Afghanistan's Karengal Valley, an area considered one of the most dangerous locations in the lingering war against the Taliban. Hetherington's interests extended far beyond his high-profile war assignments for magazines such as Vanity Fair and field reports for ABC News. Although he held degrees from Oxford and Cardiff University, he chose to spend eight years living and working in West Africa, gaining invaluable insight of the hardships inside the shattered region during the Second Liberian Civil War. His passion for humanitarian causes later qualified him to work for the United Nations Security Council as an investigator for the Liberia Sanctions Committee. During the Arab Spring of 2011, and he found himself in yet another dangerously hostile predicament. On April the 19th, he tweeted out, In besieged Libyan city of Misrata, indiscriminate shelling by Gaddafi forces, no sign of NATO. The next day, he was hit with either shrapnel from a mortar shell or an RPG, a rocket-propelled grenade. Like Robert Kappa before him, he was 40 years old at the time of his death. Number 7. Ernie Pyle a recent tribute on the U.S. National Archives website described Ernie Pyle as someone who was able to tell the stories of enlisted men 
Because he embedded himself in their day-to-day -day lives, he didn't just observe their work, he lived, traveled, ate, and shared foxholes with them. An apt summary of an ordinary newsman with an extraordinary talent for putting a human face on the dehumanizing toll of war. Originally from Indiana, Pahl got his start in journalism writing for his school newspaper at the University of Indiana. He would develop his Mark Twain-esque homespun style as a roving reporter for the Scripps Howard newspaper chain. Usually accompanied by his wife, Jerry, Paul wrote primarily human interest stories six days a week for his popular Hoosier Vagabond syndicated column. The couple eventually settled in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where his house would later become a public library. At the start of World War II, Paul crossed the Atlantic to cover the Battle of Britain, transitioning into a masterful war correspondent. America's subsequent military involvement saw him reporting from the front lines in North Africa, Sicily, Italy, and France, with his dispatches appearing in over 400 daily newspapers. Paul won the Pulitzer Prize in 1944 for his first-person accounts about infantry soldiers that he championed as the guys that wars can't be won without. After seeing his share of danger in Europe, Paul reluctantly took an assignment in the Pacific Theater. Japanese machine gun fire ended his life shortly after his arrival during the invasion of Okinawa. Shortly afterwards, a movie based on his wartime stories was released called The Story of G.I. Joe. Starring Burgess Meredith as Paul, the film earned four Academy Award nominations and launched the career of a young actor named Robert Mitchum. Number 6. John Hoagland by the spring of 1984, American photojournalist John Hoagland had managed to carve out a seemingly impossible idyllic world for himself in the sleepy coastal town of La Libertad in El Salvador. The 36-year-old San Diego, California native had recently married a local woman who also shared his passion for surfing and nature, despite the ongoing civil war spiraling out of control all around them. But true to his character, Hoagland chose to stay put, using his camera to tell stories about life and death in the small Central American country. Like many young people in the political turbulent 1960s, Hoagland became involved in movements regarding social justice and civil rights. He joined his fellow students at the University of California, San Diego in several protest marches and briefly served as a bodyguard for civil rights leader Angela Davis. He later traveled to Nicaragua, where he found his calling as a combat photographer, quickly establishing a reputation for both his tenacity and his calmness under fire. In addition to covering the Sandinista Revolution, he photographed the conflict in Beirut, freelancing for news agencies such as the Associated Press and United Press International. Back in El Salvador, the situation it went from bad to worse. Government death squads slaughtered innocent civilians at will, priests were murdered, nuns were raped, and the US financed Salvadorian army carried out a scorched earth policy against leftist guerrillas and anyone else who defied its authoritarian rule. Hoagland soon learned he was one of 35 journalists whose names appeared on a paramilitary death list. While on assignments for Newsweek, he traveled with a CBS news crew towards the town of Sujitoto, just north of the capital in San Salvador. On March 16, 1984, a firefight broke out between the army and rebel forces along a rural dirt road. Hoagland, as usual, was 50 yards ahead of the other reporters when a large caliber round from an M60 machine gun penetrated his back. His camera was still clicking away as he fell to the ground, and he eventually bled out. Number 5. Dan Eldon Dan Eldon led an exceptionally full life. He globe-shotted extensively around the world, visiting 46 countries on four continents while creating art and establishing charities along the way. He also managed to attend college in California and work as a graphic designer in New York before emerging as an acclaimed photojournalist in Africa. But above all else, Eldon was a humanitarian, and he helped improve hundreds of thousands of lives in the most poverty-stricken countries. He accomplished all of this by the time he was 22. Born in London to a British father and American mother in 1970, Eldon and his family moved to Kenya when he was seven. He chronicled his adventures throughout his life in a series of journals comprised of assorted drawings, photographs, and writings. A collection of these diaries would later become an international best-selling book called The Journals of Dan Eldon, The Journey is the Destination. In 1989, a sightseeing trip with friends through Southeast Africa provided an unexpected discovery that affected him profoundly. A recent civil war in Mozambique had caused thousands to flee across the border and crowd inside a large refugee camp in Malawi. Spurred by what he saw, Eldon created student aid charity, raising much-needed funding for people decimated by conflict. Another civil war, this time in Somalia, landed Eldon back in Africa in the summer of 1992. The fateful event transformed him into an internationally renowned correspondent, as well as impacted an entire nation. In the town of Badoa, Eldon witnessed an area ravished by famine and destruction. His haunting photographs of dead babies and skeletal survivors made front page news and were on the covers of magazines worldwide. But more importantly, they served notice 
of a staggering humanitarian crisis. The awareness helped trigger an international relief mission called Operation Restore Hope that attacks by warring factions also led to the arrival of heavily armed peacekeeping forces. Meanwhile, he continued immersing himself in the community and became such a popular figure among the locals that they nicknamed him the Mayor of Mogadishu. On July 12, 1993, UN troops mistakenly bombed a Somali villa believed to be the headquarters of a powerful warlord named General Mohamed Fa'ar Aidid. Instead, several hundred people were killed or wounded, including several revered elders and imams. Eldon and three other journalists were summoned to document the carnage and rushed to the scene. In the confusion and mayhem, an angry mob turned on the reporters, killing Eldon and the others by stoning them to death. Number 4. James R. O'Neill the American Civil War is considered to be the first major conflict to be extensively photographed. The expensive, bulky equipment, however, proved difficult to maneuver and required makeshift darkrooms full of dangerous chemicals to be towed around by horse-drawn wagons. As a result, the talent of sketch artists like James R. O'Neill became a valued commodity. His finely detailed illustrations filled weekly newspapers whose readers demanded coverage of the bloody conflict. O'Neill would also earn the distinction of being the only war correspondent killed in action during the War for the Union. James Richard O'Neill, he emigrated from Ireland to North America in 1833 with his family while he was still an infant. After first arriving in Quebec, his father Charles O'Neill relocated the family to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where the Irishman found work as the local lighthouse keeper. In 1854, James found work as a theatre stagehand, designing and building sets, and later he became a performer. Shortly before the outbreak of the war, O'Neill moved to Leavenworth, Kansas, and soon made connections at the nearby U.S. Army post at Fort Leavenworth. There, he was introduced to Frank Leslie, a staunch pro-Union supporter and publisher of the high-circulation Leslie's Illustrated newspaper. O'Neill later embedded with Union troops, sketching soldiers and battle scenes that often depicted a more realistic portrayal of events than the staged and stiff portraits made popular by photographers such as Matthew Brady. O'Neill became attached to the Union District of the Frontier under the command of General James G. Blunt in Indian Territory, present-day Oklahoma. O'Neill provided drawings of the major Union victory at the Battle of Honey Springs in the summer of 1863, as well as news reports of other engagements in the region. On October 6, 1863, a large Confederate force under Captain William Quantrill ambushed Blunt's unit near Baxter Springs, Kansas. Quantrill, a notorious guerrilla tactician, didn't believe in taking prisoners and ordered his bushwhackers to massacre the Union soldiers along with O'Neill and a military band. It's worth noting that infamous outlaws Frank and Jesse James often rode with Quantrill and may have taken part in this bloodbath. Number 3. Robert Kappa Robert Kappa is widely considered the greatest war photographer of all time. His graphic images captured the brutal realism of combat and would greatly influence the work of future generations. Ironically, his name was fake, the result of an alias concocted by a pair of unknown European photojournalists looking to make a name for themselves. It worked. Kappa's iconic, award-winning photographs of D-Day and the Spanish Civil War are considered some of the greatest wartime images ever taken. Not surprising for a man who famously once said, if the photo isn't good enough, it's because you're not close enough. Born Andre Friedman to Jewish parents in Budapest, Hungary in 1913, he later moved to Berlin and studied political science. He eventually fled the city following the rise of the Nazi party. Settling in Paris, he fell in love with a German woman named Greta Pohorel. She had recently escaped the anti-Semitic fervor gripping the country. The couple soon began taking photos and selling them to news outlets, claiming to be the agents of the fictitious American photographer Robert Kappa. While covering the Spanish Civil War, they produced the best-known images of the conflict between the fascist regime of General Francisco Franco and Republican forces loyal to the democratically elected Spanish Republic. During World War II, and having fully adopted his invented moniker, Kappa worked extensively for Life magazine, including the landing of U.S. Marines on Omaha Beach. He also parachuted into enemy territory in Operation Varsity, taking part in the longest airborne mission in history. For this groundbreaking work, General Dwight D. Eisenhower awarded him the Medal of Freedom. Kappa went on to co-found Magnum Photos, the first co-op agency for worldwide freelance photographers. Shortly before his death, he intimated to friends such as Ernest Hemingway, John Huston, and Humphrey Bogart that he wanted to work on new film projects and was done reporting from combat zones. Nonetheless, Kappa accepted an assignment to cover the First Indochina War and was killed after stepping on a landmine while embedded with a French regiment in the Thai Binh province. Number 2. Gerda Taro she worked under the professional name Gerda Taro, naming herself after the Japanese artist Taro Okamoto and Swedish actress Greta Garbo. She was also known as Little Red Fox for her ginger hair and her diminutive stature. 
After fleeing Nazi Germany, Taro would emerge as a pioneering photographer and is credited as the first female journalist killed while covering a war from the front line. Greta Pohoril, yep, same person from the previous entry, she was born on August 1, 1910, in Stuttgart, Germany, to Jewish parents. She became politically active early on, opposing the rise of the Nazi party, and she was arrested and detained on charges of distributing propaganda. She eventually moved to Paris, where her career blossomed after her business and personal involvement with the man that came to be known as Robert Kappa. As Taro, she initially began working as his assistant during the Spanish Civil War, but soon she developed a style that was uniquely her own, capturing deeply moving photographs. In 1937, she suffered fatal injuries when an out-of-control tank crashed into a car that she was traveling in near Madrid. Her death devastated Kappa for the rest of his life. On what would have been her 27th birthday, thousands of mourners attended her funeral as Père Lachaise ceremony in Paris. The Paris landmark is the final resting place of several other notable trailblazers, including Oscar Wilde, Chopin, Molière, and Isadora Duncan. Several years after her death, it would be discovered that Tarot had taken a significant amount of images mistakenly credited as Robert Kappa's early work. Number 1. Sean Flynn he could have done anything with his life, and so he did. As the only son of legendary movie star Errol Flynn and French actress Lily Demeter, Sean Flynn inhabited a world most can only dream about. But he was also an enigma with a restless soul. Impossibly handsome, although typically shy, he went looking for danger but not attention. He would also experience something his famous father never did – real bullets in a real war zone. His parents divorced shortly after he was born, and Flynn and his mother they moved to South Florida, far away from the wicked, wicked ways of Hollywood. He briefly attended Duke University, but felt out of place and dropped out after only a semester. Unable to hide from his good looks and his celebrated name, he agreed to star in The Son of Captain Blood, an exploitative sequel of the film that launched Errol Flynn's career three decades earlier. The young heartthrob would compile a string of similar credits, going for the quick cash grab before accepting an assignment with Paris Match to report on the Vietnam War. After landing in Saigon in January of 1966, he soon fell in with a band of other renegade journalists, including Tim Page, John Steinbeck Jr. and Michael Hare. Flint took on dangerous assignments with Green Berets and other Special Forces units, and didn't hesitate to parachute or descend by helicopter into a hot landing zone. He dedicated himself to becoming better at his craft with his Leica M2 camera, and provided an unfiltered account of the savage violence of this especially brutal war. His raw photographs were published by Time Life as he continued to push the envelope, going deeper on field missions and taking increasingly more risks. In 1967, Flynn traveled to Israel to cover the Six-Day War. He returned to Vietnam the following year as the Tet Offensive raged throughout South Vietnam, signaling a turning point in the conflict. Dubbed the first television war, freelancers had unprecedented and uncensored access to document history that was unfolding in real time. The excitement and danger, they were palpable. Cheap and plentiful opium added to the allure. Page, who was wounded five times and nearly killed twice, later wrote, It was a hard war to leave, a constant thrill surrounded by a coterie of brothers, bonded by experience in the heady rush of revolution and rock and roll that was the 1960s. There was nothing back in the world to match it. The incursion of North Vietnamese forces into neighboring Cambodia eventually led to a heavy military presence there, as well as reporters covering the action. Flynn had been steadily compiling hours of film for a documentary that he was making about his wartime experiences. On April 6, 1970, he and CBS cameraman Dana Stone set out on red Honda motorcycles deep into Viet Cong VC-occupied territory to shoot more footage. But they were never seen again. It's believed the men were kidnapped by VC soldiers and then handed over to the Khmer Rouge before being executed. Despite various attempts over the years by family, friends, and the US government, the remains have never been found. Flynn was declared legally dead in 1984. So I'm not going to ask whether you enjoyed the video, but I do hope you found it interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, I've got a podcast. It's called The Brain Food Show. I'm going to link to that below. Check it out if you find this interesting. It's all like this, just a little bit more laid back. Like I say, link below. And as always, thank you for watching.